My name is Jim Carl. I'm Dean of the Isabel Farrington College of Education at Sacred Heart University. Today I'm going to talk about an aspect of school choice and that aspect is vouchers. So school vouchers are the granting of uh, an amount of tax dollars per student that can follow that student to the school of that student's parents choice, whether it be a private school or some kind of a public school. So the book I wrote on this is called Freedom of Choice, Vouchers in American Education. And I used a couple of Supreme Court cases to bookend the uh, um, narrative. At the beginning was 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision, and at the end was in 2003, the uh, Zelman v. Simmons-Harris decision, which upheld uh, vouchers for um, uh, being able to use those vouchers at religious schools. So I used case studies of four states, Louisiana, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and Ohio. And I'll talk just a little bit about each one. So the first state I focused on was Louisiana with tuition grants in the 1950s and early 1960s. A lot of you have images probably of the 1960 New Orleans school crisis when uh, Ruby Bridges went to school by herself to the France Elementary School in the Ninth Ward. Um, and the reason she went to school by herself was as she integrated that school, all of the, um, Ruby Bridges was black, uh, a, a, a first grader, a six-year-old, all of her classmates were white and the parents pulled them out of the school. They boycotted the school. So my question was, where did those, where did those children go? And the answer is they went to a school that the parents created for those kids. A, it was called the Ninth Ward Elementary School. And the uh, movement behind that Ninth Ward Elementary School generated considerable support at the state level. So the legislature in Baton Rouge, um, in actually a few years before, in anticipation to the Brown v. Board of Education decision, gave school districts the option of uh, uh, closing public schools and reopening them as private schools and the state established a system of tuition grants so that funding could flow to these now um, closed public schools that were reopened as private schools. So the Ninth Ward Elementary School, that was one of those, that was one of those schools. Um, the federal government of course got wind of the Ninth Ward Elementary School and others and argued that these schools were not exactly private schools. So in a series of federal court decisions, um, the Ninth Ward Elementary School, uh, its funding was struck down in that the um, tuition grants that parents, and most of these parents were uh, working class people, a uh, little bit hard scrabble, um, so it wasn't as if they could easily afford um, the tuition payments to send their children to a private school. So once the tuition grants, the federal government abolished them in Louisiana and in Virginia and many of the other uh, southern states, um, those schools tended to um, um, collapse. And uh, new schools eventually opened in the early 1970s as the public schools throughout the South and uh, across Lu New Orleans and Louisiana desegregated. Um, my next uh, 
case study was looking at New Hampshire in the 1970s. And the reason I chose this state was because at this point the federal government got involved in um, uh, spearheading and advocating school vouchers. So it was a little bit of a change from the 1960s when the federal government was striking down school vouchers in the southern states to the um, early 1970s when the federal government began to advocate school vouchers. So there was a federal agency. It was called the Office of Economic Opportunity. It was the uh, number one agency for uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty. Um, Probably most of you are familiar with the War on Poverty for one of its surviving uh, institutions, and that's Head Start. That's the comprehensive uh, preschool kind of academic enrichment and social enrichment program that so many of our, our uh, young children have access to today. Anyway, as the Office of Economic Opportunity changed from an agency headed up by uh, Sergeant Shriver in the Johnson administration to an agency headed up in the Nixon administration by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, the Office of Economic Opportunity began looking at different educational ways that um, um, education and schooling could allegedly lift people out of poverty. And one of the ways to do that was an experimentation with school vouchers. So what the federal government did was it um, uh, convinced uh, one state, the state of New Hampshire, and there was a little bit of a connection in New Hampshire because uh, one of the Nixon advisors, his name was Milton Friedman, an economist who had a vacation home in New Hampshire and was one of the um, intellectual uh, um, founders of uh, the, the whole concept of school vouchers uh, back in 1954 and 1955. And so Milton Friedman and his connection with the governor of that state um, was able to create a, um, an agency, a state agency, that um, accessed some federal funds for the creation of vouchers. Um, the thing was that the uh, voucher experiment in New Hampshire, it kind of foundered on the shoals of bringing the concept to a reality that the school districts that were interested in school vouchers were rural districts. And in rural districts, you have a small number of students and you have uh, large distances to travel in terms of transportation. And so from 1973 to 1976, vouchers were planned, but uh, in the end, they were never fully implemented. Then I shift to um, another state, Wisconsin, and a city, Milwaukee, and look at urban school vouchers in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So in Milwaukee, um, as the Catholic um, archdiocese closed schools in the city of Milwaukee and um, open schools in some of the uh, suburbs surrounding Milwaukee, um, the S Milwaukee schools, some of them reopened as community schools. And they still maintained some of the uh, religious uh, clergy, uh, nuns mainly, teaching in these schools. And they wanted to keep them open and saw school vouchers as a means of doing that. Because again, the parents um, at these schools, and this time most of the parents, black and uh, Latino, uh, uh, could not afford the 
kinds of private school tuitions that most private schools were expecting. So um, as a means to do this, um, they kept some pressure on the state government through the 70s and into the 80s when the political climate changed and it became a climate in which a Republican governor together with uh, some Democratic uh, state representatives in the city of Milwaukee um, created legislation that enabled uh, um, parents to receive vouchers for their children in the Milwaukee uh, community schools. So Urban Day, Harambe, and three or four of the other schools founded the nucleus of school vouchers in Milwaukee. And that nucleus has grown today to quite an extensive uh, private slash public system in the city of Milwaukee where a high percentage of the students in Milwaukee are receiving school vouchers and attending school in um, private schools, both uh, private schools that are uh, secular and private schools that are religious. And how we got to that point was in the state of Ohio with the um, Zelman eventual uh, Supreme Court Zelman v. Simmons Harris decision. So in Ohio, the story there was started with a um, Republican governor, George Voinovich, along with a, um, a quite uh, powerful Akron businessman named David Brennan, who was something of a Republican kind of political operative and fundraiser. And um, he, uh, along with the governor and the uh, Archbishop of uh, Cincinnati, were um, threw in their support and gained a majority in the state legislature to pass a law that um, would send vouchers to both um, religious schools in Cleveland and uh, non-religious private schools in Cleveland uh, with a, a means test. So um, that test was that the majority of the uh, students in the voucher schools had to be uh, um, means tested at 200% of the poverty level or less. Um, this generated a, um, many legal challenges because the public dollars were going to uh, religious schools, but in 2003 the Supreme Court upheld, the dis upheld school vouchers in um, the city of Cleveland on a five to four kind of decision. And that's why we still have um, school vouchers today, um, that they have perhaps not grown to the extent that people predicted back in 2003. But there are several states in the country, among them Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, and many others that do have vibrant and growing uh, school voucher movements.